Hi, Room 15. This is Chapter 23, Captured, Secret of Nim. Speaking of schedules and countdowns, Mr. Aegis spoke suddenly. We've got one for this evening. It's getting late. The clock on Nicodemus's desk said 5 o'clock. Mrs. Fitzgibbons feeds dragons at 6 p.m. He spoke gently, but his voice had a chilling sound to Mrs. Frisbee. They all looked at her. I'm ready, she said quietly, but there are still a few minutes and one question you have not yet answered. Why did Jonathan never tell me anything about Nim or any of the rest? Mr. Aegis said, I'll try to explain. When Nicodemus and the others moved into the cave near the rosebush, they invited Jonathan and me to stay with them. After all, we had been with them for many months by that time, and at first we did. But after a few weeks, we decided to move out. We were, you realize, different. We both felt strange, associating always and only with rats, even though they were close and are good friends. As for me... I wanted more solitude and less society. Jonathan, on the other hand, was younger than I and felt lonely. So we moved at first together to the basement of the old farmhouse where I still live. Then Jonathan met you at a stream near the woods somewhere, I think he said. Yes, Mrs. Frisbee said, I remember. From then on, he worried. He didn't want to be secretive, but he didn't know how to tell you one thing. Tell you one thing. I'm sure Nicodemus has explained to you that the injections we got at NIM had two different effects. One of them was that none of us seemed to be growing any older at all. The children, yes, but not the adults. Apparently, the injections had given us all a much longer lifespan than even Dr. Schultz had anticipated. You can see why this would have been a dreadful thing for Jonathan to have tell you. You never had the injections. That meant that while he stayed young, you would grow old and older and finally die. He loved you, and he could hardly, hardly stand that thought. Yet, if it was as distressing to him, he thought, how much more painful it would be to you. This is why he could not bring himself to tell you. He would have told you eventually. I know he intended to. Indeed, you would have found it out yourself. You would have seen it happening. But it was hard. It was hard. He kept putting it off, and then finally, it was too late. Poor Jonathan, said Mrs. Frisbee. He should have told me. I wouldn't have minded. But will the children also have longer lives? asked Nicodemus. We don't know yet. He thinks so. But our children are not yet old enough to be certain. We do know they have inherited the ability to learn. They master reading almost without effort. He stood up, took out, out his reading glass, and looked at the clock. But Mrs. Frisbee interrupted again. One more thing, she said. What happened to Jenner? Nicodemus said. He left. He was against the plan from the start. In our discussion, he tried to persuade others to oppose it, too. Only a few joined him, there, though there are some others who are still doubtful about it. They're going to stay with us and try it. The argument stayed reasonably friendly, but the last straw for Jenner was when we decided to destroy the machines. Destroy them? For two reasons. One, so that if anyone ever finds the cave, there won't be any evidence of what we've been doing. Nothing but broken bits of metal debris that will look like ordinary junk. We'll put in our electric cable, our lights, and our water pipes. We'll close up all the tunnels leading in. The other reason is more important. When we move to Thorn Valley, we're going to have some hard times. We know that, but we're braced for it. If this cave is still open, with the machines and lights, the carpets and running water still here, there will be a terrible temptation to give up and move back to the soft life. We want to remove that temptation. But when Jenner heard that decision, it was made, it was made at a meeting. He grew very angry. He denounced us all as idiots and dreamers. He stamped out of the meeting, and a few days later he left with the group forever, taking six of his followers with him. We, didn't know, we don't know where they went, but we think they will try to find some place where they can set up a new life like this one. I wish them luck, but they'll have trouble. They won't, there won't be any toy tinker this time. They'll have to steer the machines and everything. That worries us some, because if they get caught, who knows what might happen. But there is nothing we can do about it. We're going ahead with the plan. Once we get to Thorn Valley, I think we can stop worrying. Justin stood up. It's time to go. We picked up, he picked up the paper with the sleeping potion in it. Mrs. Frisbee, Justin, and Mr. Ages walked together to the long corner to the rose bush. Remember, when you come up through the hole in the kitchen, Mr. Aegis says, you'll be under a cabinet. It's low, but there's room enough to move. Go a few steps for it, and you'll be able to see into the room. Mrs. Fitzgibbons will be there, getting dinner for her family. They eat about six. When she gets their dinner ready, she'll feel dragon. He won't be in the kitchen. He'll be waiting just outside the kitchen of the door of the porch. She doesn't let him in when she's cooking because he makes such a pest of himself, rubbing against her ankles and getting between her feet. If you look to your right, you'll see his bowl. It's blue, and it has the word kitty written over and over again on the side. She'll pick it up, fill it with cat food, and put it down in the same place. Then watch closely. She'll walk over to the door and let him in, and that's your chance. 
Her back will be towards you. She's got to walk about 20 feet or so. It's a big kitchen. The bowl will be about two feet from you, so be sure the packet is open. Then dash out, dump the powder into the food, and dash back. You don't want to be in sight when Dragon comes in. I can tell you that from experience. Is that how you got hurt, she asked. I got there a few seconds late. I decided there was still time, and I was wrong. At the arch in the rose bush, Mr. Ages left them. With his cast, he was not able to climb through the hole to the kitchen. There was no point in going any further. Mrs. Frisbee and Justin moved out of the rose bush and looked around them. It was still light, though the sun was low on the horizon. Straight ahead of them, perhaps 200 feet away, stood the big white farmhouse. Dragon was already on the porch, sitting just outside the door, looking at it expectantly. To their right was the tractor shed, and beyond that was the barnyard fence and the barn itself, casting a long shadow. Behind them, the, ro the woods and the mountains. To the left, Mrs. Frisbee could see the big stone in the middle of the garden, near which her children waited. As soon as her task was done, she thought she must hurry to them and get ready for the move. We go under the right side of the house, Justin said quietly. Follow me. They made their way around the edge of the yard, staying in the shadow, keeping an eye on Dragon. Justin still wore his satchel, and he had put the powder powder package in it. There was a basement under the main part of the Fitzgibbons house, and the big kitchen had been added later and stood on the foundation of concrete blocks with only a crawl space between them. Oh, crawl space beneath, excuse me. As they approached this gray foundation, Mrs. Frisbee saw that near the middle of it, a few inches off the ground, there was a square patch of darker gray. It was a hole left for ventilation, and there was a screen over it. When they reached it, Justin caught hold of the screen and pulled the corner. It swung open. We loosened it a bit, he explained, holding it open for her. Mrs. Frisbee crept through. Careful, he said, it's dark. There's a drop about in about a foot. Just jump. We put some straw at the bottom so it's soft. Holding her breath, Mrs. Frisbee jumped blindly into the blackness and felt the cushion of straw underneath her feet. In a moment, Justin landed beside her. They were under the Fitzgibbon's kitchen. Now, he said softly, look to your left. See that patch of light? That's the hole. The light comes from the kitchen. We piled dirt up under it so it's easy to reach. Come on. Mrs. Frisbee followed him. As they got near the bright hole, she could see around her a little. They were walking across bare earth, dry and cool to the touch. Overhead, there were heavy wooden beams holding up the floor, and above those, the floorboards themselves. Under the hole rose a small hill, round hill of dirt. They walked up this, and then Justin whispered, This is as far as I can go. There's not room for me to get through. I'll wait here. Just come back as soon as you're finished. Here's the powder. He handed her the paper packet. Remember to tear it open before you go to Dragon's Bowl. Hurry now. I can hear Mrs. Fitzgibbing moving around. She's getting the dinner. Be careful and good luck. Mrs. Frisbee first pushed the packet through the hole. Then, as quietly as she could, grasping both sides, she pulled herself up into the kitchen. It was light there, but Mr. Aegis had not been joking when he said the ceiling was low. There was less than an inch between the floor and the bottom of the cabinet, so that she had, could not walk properly but had to flatten herself out and crawl. She did a few steps and discovered that she was trembling. Stay calm, she told herself. Don't get panicky, or you'll do something foolish and spoil everything. Thus admonished, she crept forward again until she was near the edge of the cabinet. She stopped. From there, she could see out to the kitchen fairly well. Straight across from her stood a big white stove, and in front of it, put the lid on the pot, was Mrs. Frizz Mrs. Fitzgibbons. Whew, that's hard to say. The edge of the cabinet was so low, Mrs. Frisbee could not see her hand, but only up to her shoulders. There, Mrs. Frisbee said, as if to herself, the stew is done, the bread is in the oven, the table is set. What, where was the cat bowl? Mrs. Frisbee looked to the right, as Mr. Aegis had said. There it was, blue, with words inscribed around the side. Yet something was wrong. It was not two feet from the cabinet, but more like four or five. In the corner where it should have been rose four round wooden legs. She realized that she was looking at the bottom of a kitchen stool. No matter, she thought, the extra distance is just a couple of feet. Mr. Aegis had not mentioned a stool, but perhaps they moved it around. She crawled to her right, so close to the bowl as she could as close to the bowl as she could get without showing herself, and tore open the package. Just as she did this, Mrs. Fitzgibbons walked over from the stove. Her hand appeared, picked up the bowl, and Mrs. Frisbee heard it thump on the counter overhead. A cutting sound a can opener, a scrape from a spoon, and the bowl was back on the floor. A strong, fishy smell of cat food. Mrs. Fitzgibbon walked away. Now, she thought. Mrs. Frisbee, Mrs. Frisbee moved swiftly out into the room, across the open floor, holding the powder, her eyes intent only on the bowl. She was no longer trembling. She poured the powder, which instantly dissolved in the moist cat food. 
Still clutching the paper, she turned and sped toward the cabinet. With a bang, the lights went dim. The ceiling, which had somehow become curved, she was filled with little round moons. Mrs. Frisby kept running, but her face struck a cold, hard wall of metal. A voice shouted, Mother, don't let Dragon in yet. I've caught a mouse. Billy, the younger Fitzgibbon son, had been sitting on the kitchen stool, his feet up on the rung, eating berries from a colander. The colander, upside down, was now over Mrs. Frisby. Dun, dun, dun.